you can be turning in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation uh, 22 certainly is a uh, blessing to be at family camp. It's a blessing uh, to be able to share with you uh, this Lord's Day. As you're turning to Revelation 22, I'd like to start with a question. And that question is, what do you value and how does it motivate you? What do you value and how does it motivate you? On Christmas Eve 2007, tragedy struck uh, the community of Wauseon, Ohio. There was an accident where um, a stop sign uh, was blown and a family who had been uh, out to dinner together uh, got in an accident that was tremendously damaging. The family, uh, their last name was, was the Mueller family, and um, this tragedy happened. Uh, the, the father of the family passed away. Uh, the two boys uh, were uh, with uh, the family. Uh, the one was going into it, or it was in his senior year of high school, headed into his senior year of high school, excuse me. Then an older boy who was about 20 or 21 years old who also uh, was, was injured. The uh, junior in high school was a tremendous athlete in Wauseon. Uh, he actually ended up uh, playing for the University of Michigan uh, as a center. And... Um, but that night, as the father passed away, uh, the uh, junior in high school, his girlfriend passed away, and the rest of them were, were injured pretty significantly. Um, Elliot uh, was the name of the young man who went to the University of Michigan. Uh, Elliot uh, tore up his shoulder pretty good, but his injuries were actually probably the most minimal uh, the mother was injured, but she was okay. She made it through. And then there was Brock. And this story is really about Brock. Brock uh, had a spinal injury. And Brock's spinal injury uh, left him paralyzed from the waist down. And so as they are going through uh, all of the funerals and the grieving process, uh, Brock is left paralyzed. Elliot obviously made a, a full recovery, but Brock had spinal surgery, and the surgeon said everybody at some point wants to know what their chances are, what their chances are of, of being able to walk again. She said, they're not good. But everybody always wants a number. She said, so your number is 1%. 1%. And really, we're being pretty optimistic with the 1%. Brock heard this and was initially incredibly discouraged. One percent. And in fact, going through rehab at the medical facility, that one percent felt incredibly daunting. Of course, from the initial accident, he was in the hospital uh, for three months. And then as he recovered, two years in, there was no progress. He, he couldn't feel his legs at all. Well, the strength and conditioning coach at the University of Michigan begged Brock to work out with them. And Brock, after being begged, basically figured, I, I want to walk. And so there's, there's no question, if he thinks that he can help me, 
That's what I'm going to do. And the strength and conditioning coach, he said, you're, you're going to want to quit. You're going to hate this. And Brock was like, I'm pretty motivated. But sure enough, within six weeks, Brock felt twinges in his legs. And only six to nine months after that, he was able to walk with the assistance of two canes onto the field to lead the University of Michigan in their first uh, game of the season. He led the team out as they, many of you know, they go under a banner. And they were led by Brock Mueller with two canes and no other assistance whatsoever. He wore a shirt that said, 1%. All glory to God. Let's read Revelation 22. <clears throat> he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his bondservants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall no longer be any night, and they shall not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God shall illumine them. And they shall reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must shortly take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed who is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And he said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of the book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. And let the one who is filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness and let the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to eat of the tree of life and might, may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are dogs and the sorcerers and immoral persons and murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Let's pray. Awesome Heavenly Father, 
I am thankful for the river of life. I am thankful for that river of life which springs into eternity. Father, thankful that we are on the victorious side of this. I'm thankful that we don't have to wait for victory. Lord God, just so grateful for the things that you have demonstrated to us concerning your faithfulness, concerning your plan. And it's so humbling to be a part of that plan, to be someone who is empowered by your awesome Holy Spirit, to be part of the church of the living God, which has been your plan, and to be able to be victorious and to spend eternity with you. Pray that you would bless this time. Pray that you would bless this message that might equip the saints for the work of service, that might encourage us, Lord God, uh, to be motivated by the right things because we value the right things. Ask this in the name of Almighty Jesus Christ. Amen. Just recently, a world record was broken. A world record for memorabilia. You guys may have seen this. A Babe Ruth jersey uh, that was supposedly worn in the 1932 World Series Game 3 where he supposedly called his shot, but not really. Um, that game jersey uh, was recently sold for $24.12 million. Now, here's the kicker about that. I mean, of course, that's crazy. Um, it goes without saying. Here's the kicker. Nobody has any idea if that's the jersey that he wore or not. <laughs> they have no clue. The jersey disappeared from like the 1930s until about 1990. And then it just popped up. But they've authenticated that it's the correct jersey. Now, never mind the fact that there are other companies who say, no, that's not the correct jersey. Never mind all that. The Babe Ruth jersey sold for $24.12 million. Now, somebody really valued that jersey. And it's demonstrated by what they were willing to pay for it. They were motivated to have the Babe Ruth World Series 1932 Game 3 jersey, whether that's what it was or not. And so as we go along this morning, I want us to consider what it is that we value and how that motivates us. I want to talk about the river of life. There's so many things here in Revelation 22, packed full of tremendous stuff. And, and certainly there's an undercurrent in this passage of we win. This is the end. River of living water springing into eternal life. But I want to focus a little bit about the river or the rivers of living water this morning. And let's, let's take a look at the scripture and what the scripture has to say about those rivers of living water. We're going to set a few things up definitionally here that you may be familiar with. But John chapter 7, we're going to hit a, uh, a few passages here in John. Gospel of John. Chapter 7, starting in verse 37. John 7, 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. 
But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who, re, who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Spirit was going to be given after Jesus' glorification, and the Holy Spirit here is referred to as rivers of living water. Let's go to John uh, chapter 4. John 4, verse 10. Actually, let's pick it up in verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. A Samaritan woman therefore said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. Jesus answered and says to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. Now I want you to to remember her response, because we'll come back to that in a little while. But Jesus here is communicating the living water, the living water that he desires to give. He's willing to give of the water of life. That's his desire, is to give of his Holy Spirit. John chapter 16 Verse 7 says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. See, this Helper, the rivers of living water, God's desire was for us to partake of those waters. To be able to have those waters springing into eternity. Let's go to John chapter 5 now. John 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. So the Lord's desire is for us to have rivers of living water. And you think about that terminology, you think about Revelation uh, chapter 22, and in verse 1 it says, And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The Lord's desire is for us to have this water. And it's interesting that he uses the concept of water to communicate with us because, as we all know, water is essential to life, right? Come out to Montana where it's really dry, I realize how essential water is to life, right? Uh, <clears throat> drink more and more and more water uh, because it is, you know, so dry out here. But we all need water to live. And part of the picture that's being painted here by the Lord is that the Holy Spirit is what gives us life. That we have passed out of death into life because we have the spirit, the rivers of living water dwelling inside of us. Is that something that we value? See, the woman at the well 
She's like, I really value the ability to not have to come to the well every single day. I value that. You know, to be able to, I mean, how many steps a day do you suppose that is? I'm sure she had her Fitbit, you know, she could have told us. Yeah, that's hard work. Can you imagine the efficiency? Could be more efficient by not having to come to the well. She's, she's thinking about H2O. She's thinking about having to go back and forth. She's thinking about the ability to be able to have indoor plumbing. That's what she's thinking about. And what is Jesus offering? Jesus is offering real life. And oftentimes the very same trick or the very same pit that the woman at the well falls into has to be, is the same tendency that people fall into when it comes to evaluating the things that are spiritual or the things of the word of God. They are focused on the things of the flesh. They understand that indoor plumbing would be really nice and that has value, that has value to them because they can see how that would be useful in their lives, how that could save them steps. And so they're like, give me that. And religious people, the restoration movement even, has a tendency to focus on the things of the flesh and not the things of the spirit. But the scripture is communicating here that the things of the spirit is where life really is. And because we are partaking of the things of the Spirit right now, that's what's going to make heaven so great. And he is not going to take away those rivers of living water from us. See, the Spirit of God has been one of the main themes of the scripture. One of the things that God has developed that he wants to share with us, these rivers of living water. Let's go to another familiar passage, Romans chapter eight. Romans the eighth chapter. Starting in verse nine. Romans 8, 9. However, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. What is it that gives us life? What is it that separates whether we belong to Jesus Christ or whether we don't? It's his spirit who dwells within us. See, we have an understanding that when a person is immersed into Jesus Christ, that the Lord takes care of past sin, that the Lord takes care of that old man, that there is a death in the waters of immersion. But much more important than the death is what God brings to life. And he brings to life the new creation who is indwelt by the Spirit of God. He passes out of death into life because now the Spirit of Jesus dwells within it. That's what separates whether we belong to Christ or not. And that is what is going to continue to animate our life. As we've been going through Revelation, and I really appreciate all of the other speakers, and, and I've learned and grown so much uh, through those messages this weekend. And one of the consistent themes, I think that, that um, Mark actually had this one, is to, to him who overcomes. There's an emphasis on 
some of the outcomes in the book of Revelation because it's the end. It's the end. And so, for instance, in Revelation 2 and 3, when the scripture says, to him who overcomes, it doesn't say, to him who is baptized. It doesn't say, to him who has been immersed. It says, to him who overcomes. Because obviously, you cannot start unless you're immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But that's a beginning point. That's the beginning of your life. Because that's where you receive the rivers of living water. And that has been his point, is not just to give us forgiveness of sins, but it has been his point to give us this water. Come. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who is thirsty, come. And that has been God's plan. And now we get to participate in the plan that God has had. Let's see some of that in the Old Testament. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 47. Really appreciated uh, all the Old Testament prophecy uh, that Mike uh, brought out. God has had a plan uh, that he is working and it is valuable to be able to be on this side of the plan, to be able to see it not clouded or shrouded in mystery, but rather to be able to see it clear as God desires to show us what he has been working. Ezekiel chapter 47, verse one. Then he brought me back to the door of the house and behold, Water was flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east, for the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under, excuse me, and the water was flowing down from under, from the right side of the house, from the south of the altar. And he brought me out by the way of the north gate, led me around on the outside of the outer gate, by the way of the gate that faces east. And behold, water was trickling from the south side. When the man went out toward the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits and he led me through the water, water reaching the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching the loins. Again, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not ford. For the water had risen, enough water to swim in, a river that could not be forded. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me back to the bank of the river. And when I had returned, behold, on the bank of the river, there were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then he said to me, these waters go out toward the eastern region and go down into the Arabah. Then they go toward the sea, being made uh, to flow into the sea, and the waters of the sea become fresh or healed. <clears throat> Guys, I, I, I don't think that this is primarily about H2O in buildings. What's it looking towards? What's the point been? To help us to understand the value of the rivers of living water. And it's layered within the Old Testament. It's textured there for you to understand that this is where real life truly is. The life that the Holy Spirit gives to animate our mortal flesh. It's been, uh, we've gone to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 already today. Outer man is what? Decaying. But the inner man is what? Being renewed day by day. Again, did God choose the properties of water just arbitrarily? 
What do we need? What do we need physically, mortally? We need water. And it's the same thing spiritually. We need water. Let's hit a, a few more here in the Old Testament. Let's go to uh, Psalms. Again, you could, there's, there's a ton there in, in Ezekiel that we're not touching. There's a, there's a ton in Revelation 22 that we will not touch, okay? So uh, dig in. Uh, but I want to bring out, bring out some highlights. Psalm 36. Psalm 36, starting in verse 7. How precious is thy loving kindness, O God, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of thy wings. They drink their fill of the abundance of thy house, and thou dost give them to drink of the river of thy delights. For with thee is the fountain of life, in thy light, we see light. Don't you see Revelation 22 there? I mean, just, just flip back to, to Revelation 22 in the first couple of verses. Not only do we have the river of, not only do we have the, the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, which that's significant as well. That clear as crystal, that bright as crystal, the springing of the Holy Spirit who makes us clean on a continual basis. See, when you go back to Ezekiel, it made that water what? Fresh or clean? Well, what does the Holy Spirit do for us? It makes us fresh and clean. He continues to make sure that we have a clean conscience as we walk by the Spirit. Isn't it even called the covenant of the Spirit? And so we have a clean conscience through His Spirit. He makes us bright and clean to look just like Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in verse 5, there shall no longer be any night. They shall have not not, excuse me, and they shall not have need of the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God shall illumine them and they shall reign forever and ever. You see Psalm 36 here? There's light. Able to make bright and clean. God's plan through the ages made manifest in Jesus Christ dwelling in your mortal bodies. Let's go to Psalm 46. Go from Psalm 36 to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Starting in verse 1. Psalm 46. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling uh, pride. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of of God, the holy dwelling places of God most high. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. You see the Holy Spirit there? It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? makes glad the city of God. Is the rivers, or are the rivers of life, are they what make us glad? Are they 
but animate our lives. God will help her when the morning dawns. What is it that we truly delight in? See, the picture here in Revelation 22, certainly there's a picture of final victory. There's a picture of the fact that we win, that the revelation of Jesus Christ is such is that in the tale of two cities, we're in the right city. And that is indeed a blessing that we get to spend eternity with our king. But where did that eternity really begin? It does not begin at your physical death. It begins when you passed out of death into life. And we have the rivers of living water with us for all of eternity. If it doesn't motivate you now, what makes you think that it would motivate you then? Isaiah 48. Also, the it there was the concept. It drives me nuts when people refer to the Holy Spirit as it. He is a he. Just want to be clear for everybody there. <clears throat> Isaiah 48. <clears throat> Isaiah 48, verse 18. Isaiah 48, 18. If only you had paid attention to my commandments... I figure that's a good time to take a drink of water. <clears throat> then your well-being would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Does that sound anything like the Lord gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him? If only you had paid attention to my commandments then your well-being would be like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. And there's all sorts of people that are selling fleshly goods. Babylon offers them all. Now, the packaging that needs to be used really depends upon the person. Market to the person. And so there's a religious marketplace that is selling in different goods, but it's the same, they're different packages, same goods. It's a fleshly appeal to a people who are primarily fleshly. But if we're born from above, if we're heavenly beings, if we have been born of the Spirit, are we primarily fleshly or are we primarily heavenly and so that which should motivate us then would be that which is heavenly in nature not another fleshly appeal see in the religious marketplace you see hey you know give me the seed of blessing right so really the real reason Mike, Mike you got it all wrong okay the real reason why you should tithe Okay, is so that when you give money to God, he can then abundantly bless you here in the physical with, you know, 10, 20, 50 times as much. Just have a seed of investment and see what the Lord can do. It's weird, you know, guys sell that in that packaging and yet you take a look. Um, how is the health and wealth gospel? How did that work out for the apostles? Right? But even, even within, again, bringing, bringing it closer to home, what's, what's a lot of the appeal of the restoration movement? A lot of it is, is really based upon things of, of the flesh, isn't it? A fleshly appeal to a sweet by and by where, you know, there's... there's you don't have to deal with any political ads. I mean, 
It's not so bad. <laughs> There's some, some appeal to that, right? Uh, but it primarily, oh, well, you know, pleasure for all of eternity. But for us to really comprehend and to understand what eternity is going to be like and how awesome eternity is going to be, we're going to have to have an appreciation for that today. If we don't have the appreciation for that today, if we don't value that today, we won't have the motivation to be those who hear, well done, good and faithful slave, to him who overcomes. And so the Holy Spirit is where the life is in the New Testament. God has made this picture so clear for us so that we might understand. And then God's program come through, has come through history so that we might participate in it now. And we should understand how exceptional that is. The greats of faith who, didn't, who weren't able to participate in what we have now. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews 11 goes through faithful person after faithful person after faithful person in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. And I always appreciate verses 32 and 33 there where he kind of goes rapid fire for time will tell me, uh, will fail me if I tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and uh, of Jephthah, of David and Samuel and of the prophets who by faith, and then it goes on after it's gone through a number of different pictures prior to this of faithful men. But then what does it say in verse 39? And all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised or the promise because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Now, we're going to go to Galatians chapter 3 in just a little bit, but you put... Uh, Galatians 3, 13 and 14, and Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, a few other things together, you can show that the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of promise. Um, in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, right? For the promise for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. That defines what um, the gift of the Holy Spirit is in verse 38. For the promise. Right? Because the Holy Spirit gives multiple gifts. Scripture records that. But the promise defines what a person gets when they are immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins to receive the indwelling Holy Spirit because what you receive is the promise. And so the Holy Spirit is where the life is. And the Holy Spirit is not something that the Old Testament greats participated in. The Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So we know then that, that you could not receive the indwelling Holy Spirit until after Jesus' ascension to glory. But now we're on this side of it. And that's where life Truly is. Let's go to that Galatians passage real quick. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So did we all catch that? What was the purpose for which he redeemed us? Right. So that we might receive the Spirit. That's the purpose that he redeemed us for. God is bringing this together for us so that we might receive the rivers of living water that go into eternity. Do we value that? It's already been mentioned, but let's go to Colossians chapter 3. 
Colossians 3, verse 2. Now, start in 1. Colossians 3, 1. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. Let your mind on the things above. The pull of the earth is strong if you allow it to be. But we're not from here. Our citizenship isn't from here. And we are reigning with Christ in glory now. If we want to see his face for all of eternity, it's really important that we see his face now. Do we have that opportunity? And it's his spirit who allows us to see the glorified Christ when we're in the word of God. When we renew our minds. See, where's our treasure? Is our treasure in heaven? Or the different packaging of the things of the earth? I really appreciated Mr. Martin's last point as well. It's not just the things that are, it's not just the things that are clearly against God that can be a problem. It's those things that are keeping us focused on the earth, the distractions, the things that are making us less effective for King Jesus. No, it's a little bit funny to me, you know, the idea of, um, you know, people are really concerned and and there's all sorts of tools online, you know, you start to be, be pitched certain things like, you know, here's, here's your retirement calculator. Now, again, that, that might be a little bit more funny to me because of, of my age, but um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting because, um, you know, retirement calculator? Um, or, or being here in Montana, I've seen a bunch of political ads and it's like they want to privatize, they, they want to private, one of the candidates wants to privatize uh, Social Security. And that's being run as an attack ad. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's pretty exciting. How do we do that? <laughs> like, tell me more, you know? <laughs> what, what? It's like, I have no idea. We've been saying for 20 or 30 years that Social Security isn't going to be there. One, who cares? Two, okay, um, it is there. It's there now. But what's the purchasing power? What's the purchasing power? Is it, well, it was promised? Is it as good as you could have done if it would have been privatized? But none of that is the point. The point is, is that there's so many distractions, whether it be retirement calculators, JMU football, of course, never Michigan football, right? Um, Whatever it is, there are things that draw our attention to the earth if those are the things that we value. But if we value seeing his face now, then we'll value seeing his face for all of eternity. If we value what the scripture has to say now, we'll value the scripture for all of eternity. I really appreciate the warning right here at the end of the book of Revelation. It's like, hey, guess what? Don't add to and don't take away. Respect the word of God. We see the amazing way in which God has brought forth his word in history and what a, just a miracle that that is. And so guess what? Don't twist this for your agenda. Respect the word of God. Set your mind on the things above. Our solutions don't come from Washington. Our solutions don't come from Helena. Our solutions come from a city that is above. And those rivers of living water 
really can execute on the promise. So what's our view of the future? Again, the overall question this morning that I want to challenge us with is what do we value and how does it motivate us? We came across a a quote here recently that I really appreciated. It was pretty simple. It said, the difference between anxiety and excitement is knowledge of the future. The difference between anxiety and excitement is knowledge of the future. Well, shouldn't that make us the most excited people? We know who wins, but we don't have to wait for victory. When are we supposed to be living and walking by the Spirit? Take a look at Revelation 22 and verse 7. We'll start in six. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. You know, how do we know? How do we know? It's because of what the word of God says. It's what our faith is built upon. These words are faithful and true. You boil it all down and we know that we can trust the word of God. And so we know that he is at work. If we have been immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to transform our inner man into the very picture of the glorified Christ. How do you know that? These words are faithful and true. That's how we know it. It's, It's not from some feeling that you get. It's not because of some emotional response. No, not from any of those things. It's because these words are faithful and true. And what the Spirit promises, He's able to accomplish. Or said another way in the Scripture, what God promised, He's able to perform. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent His angels to show His bondservants the things which must shortly take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is He who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Oh, so there's an emphasis on obeying, heeding. Heeding. There's some results that are emphasized in the book of Revelation because this process produces something. Are you going to heed? Are you going to pay attention? How do we know if you're heeding or paying attention? See, our investment in the things of the kingdom, that investment grows our faith. We, we renew our minds and that produces faithful works and those faithful works produce greater investment or more faith. God's system works pretty good, guys. If you're living and you're walking by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. See, what are you motivated by? Are we motivated to see others partake of the river of life for all of eternity? Do you want others to have that same healing from the Spirit? See, in Ezekiel 47, the waters become fresh. They produce healing. Is that what you want for your neighbor? Is that what you want for your family? Is that what you want for those whom you care about, for them to have the rivers of living water that become fresh? You can see why the scripture tells us not to quench the spirit. Because if you don't value the things of the spirit, you're less and less and less motivated to live and to walk by the spirit. It doesn't have value to you. I didn't put uh, 
one dime on that Babe Ruth jersey. In fact, I'm so out of it, so, so I value it so little, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't even know where to go to, to put my $10 bid on it. Why? It's not valuable to me. It's not valuable to me. So I'm not going to bid on it. It doesn't matter. But does providing healing for your souls, is that valuable to you? Does that matter? Seeing people understand the good news of the gospel, the glory of Jesus Christ, does that matter to you? Because he does produce healing in our lives. One of the things about Brock Mueller is that there was no guarantee. It was 1%. 1% chance that he would be able to walk again. And he did. It was interesting. I heard an interview with him recently, and he said, at first, that 1% was really depressing. It was discouraging. But after that, he said, I started to view the 1% a little bit differently. Because the 1% represented that I could do this. That it could be done. That it was possible. And all of a sudden, instead of the 1% being discouraging, the 1% was actually motivating to me because why can't I be the 1%? Guys, we got something a lot better. We got something called 100%. Because what the Spirit promises, He's able to perform. And His track record always works. All we have to do is work His process. 100%. I mean, who wouldn't go to the rehab? Who wouldn't go through the workouts? Who wouldn't do whatever needed to be done to be able to get life if the odds are 100%? Brock is motivated by 1%. Spiritually, what are we motivated by? Do we believe the 100%? The Holy Spirit does provide healing to our souls. And he will do that for others as well. The Lord wants this good news spread and he wants the same, uh, he wants that uh, for us. The spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. Well, again, we've, we've had two days now of, of revelation, right? <clears throat> Who's the bride? What are we saying? The spirit and the bride say, come. Your proclamation helps you to value the things that really matter. There's value in the proclamation. Not just value in the proclamation because, hey, that that's what the Lord told us to do. That should be good enough. But there is value in the proclamation because guess what? You value the stuff that matters. That's what you care about because you know that the Holy Spirit brings healing to our souls. Are you willing to proclaim it? Your investment in kingdom things helps us to properly discern between the things that matter and the things that don't. And the Lord has communicated his desire for us to value the things of the Spirit. Not really talking about this, but it's an understanding as well of, of where, these, where the real action is taking place. Real action is taking place in the realm that we can't see. Where is worship taking place? And we didn't come here this morning to worship. What's going on? Worship, as we know, is submission to God in the inner man, but it's taking place in the realm of faith, is it not? 
Was that valuable to us? Is that important to us? Is that something that we have an understanding that I get to be in the presence of God Almighty and, and he's made it so that I can reign with him? Is that valuable? Do we value what has been written in this word? If we do, we're going to be those who invite to come to the water. There's a desire to actually want to know what the word of God has to say. It's really interesting to me. There was a, there was another guy from, from Wauseon. He, uh, he used to be a, a professor at uh, Kentucky Christian College. And uh, it was very interesting uh, because he started a wannabe mega church in the late 90s in, you know, small town of Wauseon. And it, and it had its day. It was really interesting to me because he was brought up in a church of Christ. And uh, he was a professor uh, at uh, Kentucky Christian College. I know that he uh, actually, he taught um, homiletics and uh, speech for sure at uh, Kentucky Christian College. And, you know, it was really interesting to me because you take a look at the doctrine of this mega church that he started and there's clearly no respect for the word of God. Not only does he not teach God's plan of salvation, he doesn't teach correctly about mm, basically anything. But that's who's going to be a professor at a so-called Restoration College or someplace that at least once was the Restoration College. And they have to be hip, right? So not only did they have the whole praise band and all of that, but he would routinely swear from the pulpit because that's how people talk these days. That's the best and the brightest of the Restoration Movement. Pretty exciting, huh? No, it's, it's interesting to me because something about, that doesn't happen accidentally. It really doesn't happen accidentally. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people who are genuinely uh, confused. I'm actually really excited about uh, some opportunities uh, with some of those people in the restoration movement and people who have real conviction. And I'm, I'm actually um, I'm very, very uh, excited about some opportunities that I'm having. But what's, what's interesting here is that, you know, the reason they get there is because they don't value what this actually says. They don't value the things that are above. They don't value the instruction of the Spirit. And so since that's not valuable to them, they're producing other packaging that will appeal to the masses because the things of the Spirit aren't valuable to those people. So I think one of the things that we need to ask ourselves on a continual basis is, do we value the things of the Spirit? Do we value getting the Scriptures right? Finally, as, as we close, the waters going into eternity are crystal. And we partake of them. You know, it, there is some real value here of these waters that spring into eternal life that it's going to be really nice to be able to get rid of this flesh. Be able to discard it. Don't have to carry the carcass around anymore. Do not have to deal with opposition anymore. Maybe, maybe can I get a little bit real here? Uh, to not have to deal with people who are playing church anymore. There's some value to that. But we're not going to value that in eternity if we don't value it right now. This is not going to happen. No temptation no opposition. The opposition will have been condemned for all of eternity and we will have everlasting fellowship with the Holy Spirit. If we are properly appraising things spiritually, it's obvious what needs to be done. Just like it was obvious for Brock what needed to be done, he was going to go wherever he needed to go to be able to walk. 
It's obvious. It's obvious to us that if we're properly appraising things according to the spiritual, uh, according to the spirit, it is obvious what needs to be done. If we put the value on the things of the spirit, then the things of the flesh don't have any pull. We have a hundred percent victory weight, victory rate by the spirit. And the things of the flesh are a lot like that Babe Ruth jersey. It's just an illusion. It's just an illusion. You don't even know if it's real or not. My encouragement is to appraise the things the way that the Lord would praise them, to value the things of the Spirit so that you are motivated by the Spirit. And if you do that, the Spirit says, Come. And the bride says, the spirit says, come. And the bride says, the spirit says, come. And the bride says, come, Lord Jesus.